Baruch Hashem Adonai, blessed be the name of the Lord. Today I'd like to talk about the story in Luke 19, when Jesus said, If these were silent, the very stones would cry out. It's not a well understood verse, and I'd like to unpack it. The background of the story is that Jesus is riding to Jerusalem on a donkey, symbolically announcing that he is, he is king, he is, he is the Messiah, and the crowds are cheering and shouting, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. But then the Pharisees turned to him and they said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. What they meant is that, you, Jesus, you, you're not God, you're not king, you're not the Messiah, so tell these people to be quiet. And Jesus answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. By these, of course, he meant the people around in Jerusalem, but I think he also meant all of the people in Israel. By why did he say the stones would cry out? Stones are inanimate objects. They cannot cry or shout. They cannot utter praise. Why didn't he say the trees would clap their hands, the heavens would shout? Well, all Bible is inspired by God, and every story has some significance. So what's the meaning of this verse? In Genesis 31, in the Old Testament, we read about Jacob and Laban, and long story short, Jacob went to work on the farm of his uncle Laban. He worked there for years, married two of his daughters, Leah and Rachel, he had 12 children with them, and those 12 children, they became the progenitors of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then at some point, God told Jacob to leave, to go back to the land of his fathers. And Jacob left without saying goodbye, and Laban took offense to that, got triggered, set out in pursuit, and caught up with Jacob somewhere in the desert. The situation was a little tense, and it could have led to some bitterness in the least, maybe even to some family feuding. But luckily, with the influence of God's Spirit, who spoke to Laban in a dream, they decided to make a peace covenant. And a covenant needs witnesses, so they decided to use rocks as witnesses. As strange as it sounds to us now, they decided to use rocks, stones, as witnesses. In Israel, there are plenty of, of rocks, stones. The desert is mostly stones. It's not mostly sand, but stones. So they, they picked up some rocks, made up a pile, and, and they called it galed. Galed is made up of two Hebrew words, heap and witness. Basically, they made up a pile of stones, which was their witness. Another narrative involving stones is in Genesis 28. It's about a dream that Jacob had once. He saw a ladder to heaven and God spoke to him in a dream. And basically God told him about Jesus because he said, In you and in your offspring all the families of the earth will be blessed. So this was a prophecy about Jesus and his coming. And later it says that early in the morning Jacob took uh, the stone that he had put under his head and he set it up for a pillar. And he also poured oil on it. And there's one more example of memorial heaps of stones. It's in Joshua chapter 4. Here we read that God actually instructed Joshua to set up memorial stone piles in the place where the Israelites crossed the river Jordan into the Promised Land. In Joshua 4 verse 9 says, Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan, and they are there to this day. By the way, when it says in the Bible, to this day, it doesn't mean till today. It means until the day when the story was written. From these biblical stories, Jewish people developed this, this custom of placing rocks on graves of the loved ones who passed away. When you go to a Jewish cemetery, you don't really see flowers or candles or something. You see pebbles on graves. Even though many Jewish people don't see the connection between the stories in, in, in the book of Genesis and this tradition that they have, they do know that a stone will not die and symbolizes permanence and memory. And by placing the stone, we show that we remember. The person's memory lives on. The memorial stone kind of represents the person who is deceased. 
So back to Jesus. Jesus is riding down the Mount of Olives on a donkey. And on the Mount of Olives, we have the oldest and probably the most important Jewish cemetery in the world. It's about 3,000 years old. And it's interesting because many Jewish people want to be buried in that cemetery because that's where the Messiah is coming, according to the book of Zechariah, Zechariah 14.4. And if, if Jewish people, uh, if some of them are waiting for the resurrection of the dead, they, they figured, if I am buried right there where the Messiah is coming and he will be resurrecting people, I'll be first in line for the resurrection. It's a common Jewish belief, and it turns out it's actually correct. A little more about this later. On the slopes of the Mount of Olives, on one side, there is a cemetery, and right next to it is the Garden of Gethsemane. As Jesus is making his way down into the city, on his left-hand side, he can clearly see the burial places with rocks on them. And he knew that in Jerusalem, he would have to face the bitter opposition of the Pharisees again. They were constantly harassing him, and uh, we know he wasn't really appreciated in Jerusalem in his lifetime, and he actually called his contemporaries an evil generation. But at the same time, he knew that God of Israel has faithful believers in every generation. They are called the remnant. There were people in the past who worshipped God faithfully, and they waited for their Messiah, for their King, King Jesus. They didn't know him yet. They, they didn't know him by the name King Jesus, but they saw glimpses, and, and they read prophecies. In 1 Peter 1.10, we read, Concerning the salvation, the prophets were prophesying about him, about the grace to come, and they searched and, and they inquired carefully grace to come salvation what's that that's king jesus and many of those worshipers were buried right there next to jesus's path and he could see their graves he knew who they were he remembered them he didn't really need the stones to remember because god knows who are his and we're not just talking big names here like isaiah gideon and king david Many of those people are actually not buried on the Mount of Olives. But there were many regular folks who worshipped God quietly. They walked humbly with, with their Lord. They showed up in Jerusalem twice a year to offer sacrifices. And they just trusted their, their Lord, God of Israel. Now they are all gone, and all that's left of them are those memorial stones on their tombs. And when Jesus said, these stones will cry out, he meant those stones, the stones on the graves of the faithful believers of the past. He meant worshippers who were dead but existed in memory, represented by the rocks left on their burial sites. Now those stones representing the past worshippers, they were to cry out. They were to be resurrected, live again, not just as memorial stones, but they were to be living stones. Bible actually talks about living stones, and we are compared to living stones. In 1 Peter 2.5, we read that, that we are like living stones, built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. So you so see, using stones by Jacob and Laban back in the Old Testament is not as cr so crazy after all. It was a foreshadow of certain reality to come. It was part of a prophecy. But if we take those words, the, the words that we are living stones, if we don't connect the Old Testament, the story from Jacob and Laban, to the New Testament, to the story of resurrection, we, we think this is just a metaphor. But there's a deeper prophecy in this. And at that time in Jerusalem, when Jesus, Jesus got resurrected, those words became a reality. Because in Matthew 27 and 52, we read that tombs were opened and many, many saints were raised. And they actually came out of the tombs and they went into the holy city, which is Jerusalem. And, and it looks like they actually took the same path down the slopes of the Mount of Olives into town and they appeared to many people. See, when Jesus got resurrected after the cross, he wasn't the only one who came back to life. With him, right after him, many saints, many believers got resurrected. 
He was the first fruits. But right after him, many got to live again the eternal life that Jesus offered. So the memorial stones became living stones, and they also became witnesses to God, a real Jehovah's Witnesses, not like the cult, but genuine witnesses to Yahweh. Remember the memorial stones and the story of Jacob and Laban from the Old Testament. They were to be witnesses to the covenant between Jacob and Laban. Now, these living stones in Jerusalem, they were to be witnesses to the covenant that God just made with humanity, the new covenant sealed with the blood of Jesus. And they were to testify, these living stones were to testify as witnesses, because witnesses testify to the, to the resurrection power of God. Just their sheer existence, being alive, was such a powerful proof that Jesus defeated death on the cross. And they must have been praising God like crazy. The stones cried out, just like Jesus said. He said, these stones will cry out. And I am sure they did. And they were not silent like most of the Israelites at that time. This was bigger than the resurrection of Lazarus, for example, which was still a great miracle. But Lazarus was only dead for three days. Those who got resurrected, they had been dead for, for years, maybe centuries. Now as we follow this narrative all the way from the Old Testament to the times of Jesus, it gives us a better understanding of prophecy in the Bible. We see how prophecies are multi-layered and, and how they are ever unfolding. For example, here in this one, we see four layers of prophecy, at least that's what I found. Number one is the foreshadow of Jacob and Laban. The stones are witnesses. Number two is another foreshadow. Uh, memorial stones become living stones, and they are witnesses to Jesus. And number three is those believers from Matthew 27 being brought back to life, and they are foreshadowing a worldwide resurrection on the Day of Judgment. And number four, which is uh, still to be fulfilled as well, is the supernatural reality of heaven when, when the believers become living stones in the temple of God in heaven. It's a promise of Jesus. Revelation 3.12 reads, The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And this also shows up in the Old Testament as a foreshadow because in the story of Jacob and Laban, Jacob made pillars as a, as a witness. By the way, do remember that Mount of Olives is a, is a coveted spot to be buried among Jewish people. And they are correct, because as we saw in Matthew 27, there were believers brought back to life right after the cross. That had to be, some of them at least, had to come from that cemetery. Uh, maybe some other cemeteries in Jerusalem, some other burial spots, but probably majority came from... Um, from the Mount of Olives. Well, one, one reason is that they had to walk into the Holy City. And if they were buried, let's say, in a lot, that would be a long walk. So that Jewish desire to be buried on the Mount of Olives is correct. It's amazing. But they were raised to praise God because there were not enough worshippers among the living in Israel at that time. Many were silenced by the Pharisees, intimidated by them, and there were just not enough worshippers, and God seeks worshippers. I know in Matthew we read that there were crowds cheering Jesus, but we don't know how big the crowds actually were, and I am sure they should have been bigger for everything that Jesus has done for us. And overall, Israel wasn't very receptive to, to Jesus as the Son of God, as their Savior. For example, in one parable we read that he healed ten men and only one came back to thank him. And Jesus himself said, where are the other nine? And, and, and that's from among people who owed something specific to Jesus. They owed their healing, health, maybe even life to, to Jesus. And yet, they disappeared. They didn't see him as, as, as their savior. And what was the percentage of people in Israel who actually followed Jesus as the Son of God? But that's how important worship is. Jesus actually raised some people back from the dead 
when he couldn't find enough worshippers in Israel. But this also brings me to the issue of rejection of God. In John 1.11 we, we read that he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. God's heart has, must have been broken so many times. And this is a glimpse into the rejection that Jesus endured. Rejection hurts the most when it comes from the people closest to us. And that's what happened to our Savior. Israel was the closest nation to God from among nations. And then within Israel, uh, the Pharisees were supposed to be, were supposed to be the closest people to God. They knew the scriptures. They were supposed to teach the scriptures to people, represent people to God and God to people. But they rejected God's son when he came and they wanted him dead and in the end they achieved their goal but there's plenty of rejection among Gentiles too I mean, think about it God sends his son to pay for our sins and to die for us wretched dirty sinners offering us eternal life salvation healing blessings and what's the response? People want him removed. People want him gone from life. Why? Because he wants to save us. So ask yourself, do you worship God? Do you live with a grateful heart for the gift of salvation? Do you thank Jesus for what he has done? Or are you maybe silenced? Are you silenced by the culture around us? Intimidated by, by your unbelieving neighbors? co-workers, maybe the HR department at work? Are you, are you searching the scriptures, waiting for Jesus? Are you looking forward to his coming, to his second coming? Are you waiting for him? Worship God and give him glory and he will give you eternal life. Be like those unknown heroes of the faith who got resurrected first. Jesus is coming back again and I guarantee you it's going to be pretty soon. Let's take this promise of Jesus seriously. He says he wants to make us pillars in, in his father's temple in heaven. Jacob was prophetically making pillars out of stones. And now Jesus wants us, his living stones, to become his holy priesthood in heaven, in glorious heaven, for eternity. You can live forever. It's great news. Stay strong in the Lord, brothers and sisters. Worship God. Look forward to the second coming of Jesus. Search the scriptures and wait for him and pray. And I'll talk to you soon. God bless you. In you, oh Lord, I put my hope. In you, oh Lord. I trust to you, O oh Lord, I lift my soul in you, O oh Lord, I trust. Let me not be put to shame, let not my faults prevail.